Okay, so, sounds great. Okay, well, welcome everyone to our Innovation X Roundtable event. Um, thank you for joining us for the future of healthcare is our topic today. Um, if you go to our website, inox, I-N-N-O-X dot berkeley dot edu, you can see we have another um, seven events or so uh, coming this fall. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce um, Iklat Sidhu. Iklat is the Chief Scientist and Faculty Director uh, for the Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology here at UC Berkeley, and he's also a professor in the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department. So Iklat's going to give us a little bit of concept about today, and then we'll kick it off with our panel. Uh, Iklat, please go. Okay, great. All right, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, event, the uh, Innovation X Roundtable. This one is on the future of healthcare. And um, I want to give you just a little bit of background, both on the talks as well as the center. Uh, and then um, from there, I'm going to hand it over and, uh, and we'll get started. So um, the first thing is uh, um, this, we kicked off this series of roundtables um, with the idea that um, a lot has changed in the world recently, um, you know, be, partly because, not partly, but, you know, obviously the biggest change that's happened recently is the global pandemic that we're, we're currently in and, and will be out of it at some point. But um, while that change is going on, there's a lot of other things that are changing. It's kind of a like a, a cycle or a, or a cascading effect of changes. And that affects things in um, health conditions around the world. It affects the economy and the financial structure, the, the entire side of the economy. Uh, it changes what we consume. It changes how we consume things. Um, so all kinds of things are changing. And that means that um, some things are, are, are actually growing and other things are um, changing in, in less positive ways. Uh, but just to get a handle on what are all the changes going on in the world, we're trying to figure out what does that mean in different industries. So uh, one industry that's very important is healthcare. And what does it mean in healthcare, all the changes that are going on? And, and in effect, um, maybe we, we've just had an acceleration of changes that would have even happened before, but, but they're happening faster now. So with that, I'm gonna, um, uh, I wanna more or less start the round table, but before I can do that, I'd like to share just a little bit about the center with you. And it provides actually some important context and I'll tell you why in a second. So um, first thing, I need to actually share my screen uh, to give you this context. So I'm about to share a, a slide presentation. Now the next tricky part, and this rarely works without a hitch, is that I'm going to put it into presentation mode. So uh, in that process, let's see, it takes a couple seconds. All right, let me just check with everyone. Um, are you seeing a screen that has um, one big slide on it, or are you seeing um, speaker notes? It's the right version. Okay, all right. Um, so what I what I'd like to do is show you basically one slide. It's the one after this, and it's to help you understand what are the things that happen at Sitarda Center, and um, the reason why it's important for the audience as well as the panel itself to understand the center is because we're organizing these roundtables not only to understand the future of the industry, but also as many advisory board meetings back to Berkeley. So we want to know how can Berkeley and Sitarja Center best engage in this topic, and we want to know how to collaborate with the other people in the industry that are involved in these changes. So for that, we just have to tell you a little bit about what the center does. Um, and I have that actually all in one slide. So uh, this slide says, that our mission is to empower innovators to positively change the world. Uh, we originally um, uh, had written empower innovators to change the world. And then we realized 
it's actually possible to change it in a negative way as well. So we thought, why don't we go ahead and be clear about that, um, change it in a positive way. Now, uh, the center uh, goes back to 2005, so this is 15 years of the center's um, not only existence, but growth. There's three big categories of things that happen at the center. One is that there's a set of courses that are under the category called Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship. And they're mostly challenge-oriented classes. They're very much venture-oriented, but, but the deeper thing that's going on is that we are working on the psychology of the students to be entrepreneurs and innovators. So the topics of story, mindset, behavior, how do teams get formed, how do they work together, all of that is happening while they're working on their ventures. So that's Berkeley method of entrepreneurship. If I, I don't know if my pointer is pointing okay, but anyway, um, that's the one on the left. The, the second one is that we have innovation labs, we call them X labs, and we, we have a number of them. We have one uh, that is uh, data science oriented. So um, data X is, is actually the name of the lab and the course. Uh, the formal name is Apply Data Science with Venture Applications. Um, you know, this, uh, in, in this lab, we, we're doing about 30 projects every semester, uh, just as an example, and um, very practical. You know, everything from figuring out whether a person needs a knee surgery by looking at their x-ray, or um, it, it, in a way, it's a platform and all kinds of companies and, and students, they bring whatever they can to this lab. So um, students bring their skills, uh, different organizations bring different problems, they may bring their skills, they may bring their data, and all this mixing is going on. Um, solutions are happening. Uh, we have the same thing going on with blockchain, with plant-based meat, with sports technology. Uh, we're doing things with 5G, AI, um, and the mobile space. And the last category is that we do uh, global and professional education. And we're taking all the things that we're learning in our labs and in the other courses, and we're making it available in, for example, our engineering leadership program and other classes that are listed on the right side there. Overall, um, we, we care about innovation that matters. It's practical, it's essential. There's a very large ecosystem behind the center. Uh, thousands of Berkeley students, 15 global partners, many executives, investors, so forth. So um, I wanted you to, uh, the panelists and the audience, to be aware of this context. And like I said, uh, I'm about to turn it over to Shomit. And Shomit, I'm going to charge you with uh, taking the conversation in a way that we can understand, given what we do, how can we best interact with what's going to happen in the future of healthcare. So I'm going to stop my share. By the way, when I do stop the share, what typically happens is that my video seems to stop working. And I don't know why that is. So I'm not really leaving. If that happens, I might have to log out and log back in. Um, it's a weird Microsoft to Apple to Zoom bug. I don't know what it is, but um, just wish me luck. I'm going to stop the share and let you take over. I'm handing it over to Shomit Ghost, uh, who is um, um, associated with the center in many ways, including being on the board and teaching uh, in our program. Shomit, uh, why don't you take over from here? Great. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Iqlaq. As Iqlaq mentioned, I'm Shomit Ghosh. I'm uh, um, the industry fellow, a board member, and also a lecturer here at the uh, Sutarja Center, and I've been doing that for about 15 years. Uh, thrilled to be here, and thanks to everyone here for attending. Uh, we have such a great panel today. We have Thomas Ernest, who's the uh, founder and CEO of Savant Health Tech, uh, Oliver Kion, who runs um, Venture Investing for Intuitive Sur uh, Surgical, and Daniel Ramirez, who runs Venture Investing for Leo Pharmaceuticals. So um, let's just dive in and have each of you introduce uh, yourselves to, uh, to the audience, and then we'll get into the questions. And in, in addition to introducing yourself, uh, can you tell us a little uh, also about what your organization is doing in the space of healthcare innovation, just to help frame our follow-on discussion? And um, starting just in alphabetical order by, by last name, Thomas, would you like to lead off? 
Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation to participate in this uh, roundtable, especially at a time where it's such, such a relevant topic for all of us. Um, my background is actually in physics. I, after getting a doctorate in physics, I spent three years as a postdoc at UC, University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, then moved to Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, where I um, spent over 20 years uh, rising to the level of senior scientist, center head and group leader, primarily leading efforts in structural biophysics, synchrotron radiation, automation, and, and overall technology development toward uh, structural biology projects and understanding the the biology of complex systems. I, I then, after leaving LBL, after 20 years, I spent a number of years as a visiting professor at the Shanghai Institute of Applied Physics, doing the same type of work, mainly synchrotron radiation and X-ray free electron laser uh, efforts applied to understanding biology at a molecular and cellular level. After returning to, to Berkeley, I, I became interested in a number of things. One thing was, um, how healthcare system works, the healthcare system works, and also in, in blockchain technologies and distributed systems. I, I'm fairly familiar with distributed compute systems and being uh, becoming familiar with blockchain actually uh, allowed me to start formulating some ideas about how to um, apply uh, advanced technologies in digital healthcare in a way that preserves privacy for the individuals and also allows them to maintain a certain amount of data ownership and control about where their data is used. So um, over the, I, I started Savant Health Tech just this year. It's a very new company. And we're, we're both basically focused on uh, developing a decentralized team of uh, developers and partners focusing on uh, privacy-based um, computation and healthcare. Uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning applied to healthcare to optimize the information we have across many different data silos. This is why privacy concerns are so important. Integrating genomics and personalized medicine into the same, into a healthcare information environment, and, and also understanding um, healthcare econ economics uh, in a way that you can reduce costs, which would be very beneficial, of course, to the quality and access of, of everyone to, to healthcare. Uh, COVID-19 has basically, um, well, I started, I, I began this company actually in January of 2020, and obviously we became aware of COVID about the same time. And it's actually been a, a quite an accelerant, as I can talk about later as well, but also um, I, it really has allowed the public to focus on the importance of healthcare, not only in terms of our health, but also the economy and um, social well-being as well. So um, we're focused on building technologies for integrated digital healthcare. Great, thank you, Thomas. Uh, Oliver. Hi there, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. And, and thanks, Iklak and uh, folks at Berkeley for, for the panel today. Excited to dig in on these topics. My name is Oliver Keown. Uh, as Shomit mentioned, head of the uh, venture arm at Intuitive Surgical. My journey into healthcare and venture capital started back in Scotland, where I'm originally from. Um, I trained as practice as a, as a junior doctor, really at that time, you know, getting involved in startups and seeing the opportunity to have an impact at the intersection of science, technology, uh, clinical policy and, and startups. Uh, I made the leap into venture capital about four years ago, moved out to the Bay Area uh, with my partner and my Bernese Mountain Dog, all of us adjusting to working from home. Uh, and so hope, hope won't get any zoom bombs during, during the panel on that front. Um, as I mentioned, working for Intuitive Surgical, which is local to Berkeley here in the Bay Area, and Intuitive has pioneered uh, the development of robotic assisted surgery over the last 25 years. Folks on the call may have heard of the Da Vinci robots. Um, you know, today we've trained over 30,000 surgeons, uh, produce, um, overseen 7 million procedures on our systems worldwide. The group that I lead within Intuitive is the venture arm. And really we're about investing in early stage uh, opportunities and future leaders that are driving the future of digitally driven, minimally invasive care. Uh, so what we do is we bring resources, we bring partnership and support to those early stage companies across digital devices, therapeutics and diagnostics. Really those that are driving what we at Intuitive call the quadruple aim, which is better outcomes, lowering the total cost of care, better patient experience, and better care team experience. And 
so as you can imagine across all those disciplines, uh, the, the, the realities of COVID are, are, are in acute focus and seeing a lot of exciting trends and opportunity uh, amidst what is otherwise you know, quite, a, quite a tragic time here in the US. But it's really excited about the panel and uh, over to you, John. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Shamit, and hi to, hi, hello to everyone. So I'm, I'm from Colombia. And I started working um, in Latin America with, with McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm. Then I, I worked for, for Coca-Cola Company in Latin America as well. And then I moved to Europe uh, where I joined Leo Pharma. Uh, Leo Pharma is a Danish pharmaceutical company that is focused on, on dermatology. It's been in the market for more than 100 years and it has a global reach. And one of the most interesting aspects of Leo is that it is 100% owned by a foundation, the Leo Foundation. And the purpose of this foundation is to ensure that Leo can operate over time. So all the profits are reinvested in helping people with skin diseases. And uh, one of the implications of that is that we started investing in technology as a way to support patients. Um, so we created what is called the Leo Innovation Lab, uh, which is a digital health unit of Leo Pharma. Uh, we have a venture studio in Copenhagen, and we also invest in digital health startups. My role is to lead the investments in digital health startups. Um, so some of the technology areas where we are focusing, I can mention three that are very relevant uh, for you know, the, the current uh, situation of the market. So one is uh, decentralized uh, clinical trials. So we have a very you know, important initiative in running interventional trials remotely. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is using machine learning um, and AI to diagnose, monitoring, and predicting skin diseases. And the third area is we are using, you know, devices to measure different aspects that would help patients to either understand what medications could help them if they are working or to uh, understand better their symptoms. So I'm talking about sweat sensors to measure cytokines in the skin. And I'm also talking about um, Wi-Fi measurement of each. So it's totally invisible measurement of symptoms in, in patients. I'm based in, in the Bay Area and I've been here for three, for three years more or less. Super, great. Uh, wonderful panel here, for sure. So um, Daniel, let's start with you since you're talking about the, uh, the work that Leo has been doing in digital innovation and healthcare. And in particular, the question I have is, you look at COVID-19, which is the biggest crisis that's besetting uh, the planet today, it happens to be a med medical crisis. Um, how has COVID-19 either accelerated or derailed healthcare innovation? Has it accelerated it um, or has it taken it um, you know, a, a field of where it would have been because of the stresses that it's, it's placing on the healthcare system? How have you seen that? Yeah, so, so my view is that it, it has, of course, uh, accelerated innovation. And uh, I think it can, see, it can, it can be seen from, from two aspects, the high-level aspect and then the detailed aspect. So from a high-level aspect, you know, we have four things that are accelerating innovation. The first one is COVID is a new medical problem and we have to solve it. So we need innovation to solve a new medical problem with all the medical problems that, you know, that are derived from it. Second, we have a new structure in the society with social distancing with the same healthcare needs. So we need new tools and new solutions to provide the healthcare needs to people under social distancing. Third, there is a sense of urgency in large organizations, government and corporations, and this is removing some barriers, you know, some, some regulations, some bureaucracies being removed because there's a sense of urgency to solve some of the problems derived from, from COVID. And the last thing that is, you know, accelerating the innovation is, of course, the funding. You see that, for example, the first half of 2020, the, the funding in digital health was about 5.4 billion, 1.2 million more or less more than last year in the same period, which is a really, really interesting growth. You have the government giving grants, you know, um, the, the Congress, you know, giving grants so far like 3.5 billion for research related to COVID. And then you also have some government expenditure. You know, the, the U.S. government alone has secured 700 million doses of the potential vaccines, right? So that means there are funds there for companies uh, to, to innovate. So, you know, it, it has accelerated at a, at a high level. Now, at an individual level, it depends because what crises do is they change the environment. And when the environment changes, as a person, as a family, 
as a business or as a community, you will either end up in a better or in a worse position. It is very likely that you will not end up in the same position. And it depends on how you accept the situation and act accordingly. So for some organizations, for some businesses, it has accelerated innovation. For some others, it has affected their business and probably stopped some of the, the good work that they were doing. Okay, great. So um, I think a nice segue here from Daniel then, then to you, Oliver. Daniel talked about the accelerating of, uh, effects within the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, intuitive surgical, of course, is in the device business. Uh, what, what's been the impact of COVID-19 on the device business? Acceleration, deceleration, how are you seeing it? Yeah, I mean, so no doubt COVID has accelerated innovation. I think Daniel you know, framed it well. It, the environment has changed and people have to adapt, right? It's new products, it's new technologies, it's new behaviors. Um, I, I'm seeing, you know, writ large, not necessarily even device focused, but, you know, at a, at a writ large, three responses to this crisis um, that, are, that are really making way for this innovation. One is in the adoption of, of technologies. Yeah, you know, it, it can't be stressed enough the willingness to adopt the speed with which providers and healthcare systems uh, and large complex institutions are uh, taking on technology um, in, in short shrift here has been pretty profound. Um, you know, both hearing from provider systems themselves as well as startups, you know, sales cycles that traditionally took 18 months um, in the hospitals for digital health tools and telehealth and other things taking five to six days to go from pitch to close and, and integration. It, it, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and and you we're seeing that you know across the board. I think from from a technology perspective, uh, you're you're seeing a lot of innovation happening, a lot of startups repositioning for a COVID value proposition, but also new innovations, you know, advances in testing. We talked about telehealth, telesurgery, right? This is a, a, a clear impact. You're having less access for reps and some of the support infrastructure and people that would traditionally be in the operating room. And, and now at a time where you have to manage that access, you have to be very clear about who's, who can come into the, the healthcare setting. You know, we need to beam people in through, uh, through remote and, and through video, which is, which is pretty exciting. I think the third, and then this is more systemic, is, is policy making. You know, we, we've seen quite a lot of exciting policy innovation, and I think that's going to be a pretty profound enabler uh, for the long term. You know, CMS expanding reimbursement for uh, for telehealth services in outpatient settings. Um, you follow the money. You know, that that's going to be a profound change. Uh, some of the, the the traditional HIPAA and security uh, legislation around data breaches and um, being um, kind of reduced for for good faith breaches in the short term. To, to help create a, a system of trust. And, uh, you know, for some of these telehealth players, um, kind of reducing the barriers to licensure across states, some of these things are gonna be, be pretty profound. Um, you know, I think with specific respect to, to devices in, in, in a world where, you know, non-critical procedures have been impacted and, and you know, hospitals have had to focus on um, short, kind of sharp focus, that, that's, uh, that's obviously going to have an impact. But I think we're seeing a recovery in a lot of these markets, which is exciting to see. Um, actually, before we go to Thomas here on this question, um, stopping here with, with Daniel and Oliver, since you're both on the investment side, and and you both mentioned that we've seen this, this pace of adoption and acceptance uh, increase. Um, do you believe that this is going to sustain post-vaccine? Or will we go back to the process as it was before? I, I think I think it will largely sustain. You know, I think there's there's probably been a, a balloon, you know, here at the beginning in terms of adoption of that critical infrastructure and some of those critical uh, applications and tools that are needed specifically for COVID. But I think we've you know we'll have seen a, a greasing of the wheels, as it were, uh, for how decisions are made, how value propositions are recognised for digital tools. And, and I think that will, will pave the way for, for, for longer, term, um, longer term innovation. But you know, the fundamentals don't change. You know, startups and companies providing digital solutions need to have a very clear value proposition, be it one for COVID or be it one for uh, clinical, you know, kind of outcome improvement or, um, or reducing costs in the system. And so those fundamentals don't change. 
And Daniel, would you also agree then that there, there's kind of no going back at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I see it, you know, in two ways. One, you know, from a habit changes in the, in, in the population, I think we are moving, let's say, forward 10 steps. And after this, we will go back, but no more than five steps. So we will move forward for sure. Uh, I don't think, you know, the, the habits will stay as they are right now. Uh, but then from a, from, a, from a company's point of view, this, you know, I think this is a very good, you know, um, how can I say this, a small acceleration period for companies to become stronger. So after the pandemic, they will be in a better position, so they will be able to push for further change. Uh, so these are the two aspects that I think will, will be very positive you know, post-COVID. Okay, great. So, so Thomas, getting back to the question on COVID-19's impacts, either as an accelerant or something that derails, and you're looking at healthcare innovation at a, at a very fundamental level. So is your perspective similar to what, what Daniel and, and Oliver have said, or how, how might it be different? Well, I, I, I really don't have a good understanding from what the investment side would be, but I certainly can see it um, at, at a basically a uh, scientific uh, industrial level, at a founder's level as well. Um, what, I, I, I'm a technologist and I want to stay away from uh, policy, but I, I do want to point out that um, the healthcare system before COVID was in the United States was also very, very expensive and the prices were, the cost the percentage of the GDP was increasing dramatically. And, and um, COVID obviously has focused our attention on this, but one thing it shouldn't focus our attention on, it should primarily focus our attention on, is how do we make improvements? It, clearly, even at an economic level, um, a healthy, productive workforce is really a primary entity to keep uh, economic productivity and economic viability. So th there's a lot of discussions now about the trade-offs that we have with lockdowns. And I think it's really, um, I, I prefer to avoid that and stay focused on, on, on data-driven things. But what, what I do think is there is a lot of data out there, but it's not being particularly utilized as well as it should be. Some of this has to do with uh, the lack of integration across what we all refer to as data silos. And this can be your healthcare information that your doctor has, the information that um, of, of, of your genomic sequence, a number of other things, wearable information you may have, economic information, uh, environmental information of where you may live. And all this information, if it could be utilized properly, would be extremely valuable, not only for the individual patient, but for the, but for the community as well. So the question is, is, is how do you begin to capture, uh, I'm sorry, I should say, how do you begin to utilize this information in the optimal way and in a way that preserves the privacy of the patient? Uh, not only is that a fundamental uh, principle that I think we should all work from, but actually in order to get uh, implementation and adoption, you have to make sure that patients understand that their privacy is being protected. So what we're really focusing on is, is ways that we can um, utilize this information optimally, but still maintain patient privacy. We're involved in a number of projects, including with, with some global partners that involve um, uh, epidemiological surveillance systems. And we've all seen a number of um, contact tracing approaches that have been used. I, I, I believe none of them have shown themselves to be particularly effective for a, ver a various number of reasons that would be too long to really uh, go into here, but have been well documented. Um, w if we had information on, um, from hospitals, primary patient um, uh, care individuals, maybe the wearables that individuals had, genomic sequences, a broad range of medical information, and, and this would include mobility information about where people or where populations are moving around from time to time and how that's distributed. We, we could utilize this information in a lot more effective way to make um, a predictive uh, way, in a predictive way that we could mitigate diseases like, like COVID-19 and, and others. I, I do wanna make a very important point. We need to use this, we need to use COVID-19 as an opportunity for learning as much as we can about how not to have this repeat again. And, and as we know, epidemics are not unique to our century. There was one about 100 years ago and throughout human history, there, there's been epidemics that have been similar to this. Without the information, um, 
viewed in an objective data-driven way, we, we won't be as well prepared to address not only uh, getting us out of, of this particular epidemic, but how we can deal with the, the, the epidemic to come. So our, our goal is to, to build tools, once again, for um, integrated digital healthcare. And uh, th that can have a broad set of meanings, but basically it means setting up a uh, healthcare information environment and um, in a way that you can maintain privacy and utilize the information in the optimal way with, with methods like artificial intelligence, deep learning, et cetera. And it sounds like you're, you're agreeing also that, that COVID-19 has served as a, an accelerant, a catalyst to make this happen more quickly than it would have otherwise? It, it's most definitely accelerant. And, 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 for, and as uh, Oliver and Daniel pointed out, that there's a lot of government money going into this as well. Essentially, almost every, uh, Department of, of our government. I'm not sure about the post office, but certainly Department of, of, of um, HHS, DHS, DOE. Many different parts of the government are focusing on COVID-19. What one thing actually they could they can improve, of course, is the integration of those efforts together. And but by having a way to um, look at this information in a way which, once again, maintains privacy of the individuals, but looks at it at an individual community and broader level. We, we can, I think, uh, not only address this epidemic better, get back on the road to recovery, but be much better prepared to deal with future epidemics. All right. Well, the consensus here then is that COVID-19 is uh, helping um, spur healthcare innovation, which is great because we need to have healthcare innovation. Um, so, Oliver, let's start with you. What's an example of a healthcare innovation that's going to happen today, which if COVID-19 hadn't happened, wouldn't have happened for, you know, five or 10 years from now? What are you seeing that uh, has actually been brought to the forefront as a consequence of our current pandemic crisis? So, yeah, great question. I think one area that certainly there were fledgling shifts towards um, towards the transformation, but this concept of on-demand healthcare, the, the consumer interface of healthcare, how it's delivered, how it's accessed, how it's experienced. I think you, you know, in the last the last six months, we've seen on the investment side, you know, billions of dollars going into this segment. It's becoming the, the kind of highest uh, highest funded segment in digital health, and seeing it in terms of traction. You know, I'm speaking to startups that are working in telehealth, as it means consultations at home or, you know, delivery and uh, uh, utilization of diagnostic tests at home or pharmacy and, and the like. And you're seeing accelerations in revenue for, for some of these companies, three to four X in, in six months. It's, it's a profound shift. And, uh, you know, so I think that's, that's one area that's super relevant to, to our experience of, of, of healthcare um, maybe to, to throw a, an alternate example that's pretty profound um, uh, and, and maybe less on the high tech side, you know, this is a global challenge and you're seeing um, on demand across public health too. And so, you know, this idea of distributed manufacturing, 3D printing, we're seeing in places in Africa and other low resource settings, um, a, a, a profound shift to distributed uh, manufacturing capabilities for PPE, for masks, even for ventilators. Uh, and that's something else that, you know, was always, always possible. But in a, in a time of crisis, we've seen um, a shift in infrastructure laid out. So I'd say th those are two kind of contrasting themes that I, I think are, are, are definitely happening today at a faster pace than they would have without COVID. All right, great, super. Uh, Daniel, same question for you. What, what are you seeing here? since we're all agreeing that things have been accelerated, what are you seeing now um, in terms of innovations which are happening specifically because of COVID, which left to normal circumstances might not have occurred for another five years? Yeah, so, so in addition with uh, what Oliver mentioned, uh, I, I think there is an area that is very interesting and is becoming super important uh, and has to do with uh, population health management and exposomes, which is the measurements of everything that an individual is exposed to. So what COVID showed was that, you know, something like an epitome could disrupt the society big time. So what I, what I see is, you know, organizations uh, like business and governments spending money to make sure that they can either detect what is out there affecting the individuals or detect er for early detection of potential threats. 
Um, so, uh, a, you know, it could be similar to what happened after 9-11 with, you know, air, air travel, you know, security or, you know, smoke detectors that we have, we have everywhere now. So I think, you know, this, this part of monitoring what's in the air and what is the individual is exposed to is becoming very, very important. Okay. Thomas, same question for you. Um, a couple of things. I, I, I think the development of, of rapid test, even though it hasn't been as rapid and prominent as, as we would like it to be, has been somewhat surprising, as have efforts by very legitimate uh, teams to increase the speed of, of, of um, developing vaccines that are, that are safe and, and, and viable. None of the, neither of those things are in my area, but I, I, as, a, as a layperson observing, um, those have been very impressive. Because what I, what I spend most of my time thinking about really is on the information technology side. I, I, I have seen a, a, an explosion there as well. Um, I, I mentioned um, um, artificial intelligence and deep learning earlier, and, I, I, and those are concepts that have, of course, been around for several years. But the ability to combine that with, with, with cloud services and to, act, and to um, either aggregate or be able to have access to, to different types of data um, and to be able to integrate that in an intelligent and usable way. We're still a long ways away from that, but, I, but there's certainly a number of groups and a number of teams that are putting effort into developing uh, those particular things. And, and of course, you know, the, the, whole, the whole idea of things like you know, genomics and personalized medicine and, and these other things we're talking about is to be predictive, not, not just to be able to, to be descriptive of the situations you have it now, but to be able to predict what could happen in the future such that you could take um, either community or individual therapeutic actions that would help mitigate it. I, I think I think we've moved a long way in that direction now. And, and, and also, I, I think um, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how people are, um, are willing to accept uh, the trade-offs between privacy and, I don't want to use the word surveillance, it seems like a little bit strong of a word, but uh, that, uh, data capture, okay, I, I guess that, that's a better phrase. Uh, how, how we will go forward in the future with, with evaluating those trade-offs as a society. I, I think that's a really, those are questions that we're coming, beginning to come more and more to grips with, but we're still a long ways away from having a broad uh, consensus about how to approach. And with, and with those rich perspectives in mind, Thomas, um, um, if you're founding the next great healthcare startup today, what would that startup be? Well, because, since I just founded a startup uh, this year, I, I think I think um, it, it would probably in, be indicative of what my th thoughts are. We're a long way from being great, but hopefully uh, we, we can achieve some success and make an impact in the future. I, 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 for me, there's a lot of information that's not being utilized in an effective way. And, and, and also, of course, all data has a certain amount of um, reliability and, 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 and that you have to factor in. So how do you, my focus and that of many is how do you capture and utilize this information in the most effective way for uh, the benefit of individual and community and country and global healthcare? Um, I, 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 think, I think things have moved a long way in that direction, but there, there's still a lot of trade-offs that we have to, um, um, to, to, to come to grips with. And, and, and a lot of it is still a research project more than it is something that needs to be, that, I'm sorry, that's ready for um, implementation. Great. So uh, Daniel, same question back to you. So you're also sitting in the midst of a very rich innovation ecosystem. If you, based on all the perspectives and insights that you have, if you were founding the next great healthcare startup, what would that be? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's an interesting question. So there could be two, two startups. Uh, one is building on the expo, something that I just mentioned. So something like a waste, a data-driven company that measures massively the exposure to bacteria, viruses, harmful chemicals for individuals. That's exciting. And the other one is given this huge wave of telemedicine, what is this feature that all telemedicines will need, but they will not build? So what about, you know, identity, you know, validation for all the patients or things like that, because they will need some tools to, 
you know, to fix their, their products or to improve their products and they will not have time to build them. So there has to be these very few suppliers that will be able to serve them all. All right, uh, great thoughts both. Um, Oliver, blank page, you're founding the next great startup. Uh, what would that be? I'll, I'll just invest in, in Thomas and Daniels and keep it, keep it simple. <laughs> Um, but uh, no, no, you know, I, I trained as a, as a clinician, so I, I'm always going to start in that kind of unsolved clinical need perspective. You know, taking a segment here, um, there is such huge variability in care today. You know, at each hospital level, that variation in avoidable complications, for example, costs millions, tens of millions of dollars. And there's a lot of operational efficiencies. I think actually building on a very similar theme that, that Daniel and Thomas is kind of startups uh, into that, you know, there's never been richer data available, clinical, genomic, um, procedural, um, even through the social determinants of health. And I think taking the lens that we've seen in precision medicine and how we've gone from, you know, cancer to specific tumor to the genetics and developed diseases, or developed therapeutics and, uh, and treatments for, for, for cancer, Thinking of the tools powered by data, you know, sitting in the hospital, sitting in the healthcare system, which should go from wellness to wellness. Um, you know, what are what are those, uh, those those engines that can help drive individuals on their path of care through the system, be it surgery, be it chronic disease, be it whatever. I think I think that 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 area is rich and ripe for for for, for startups that are you know data native, and um, so so that would be my my my, my area. Okay, well, nice to hear that commonality of, of the, the data underlying all of this. And let's stick with you here, Oliver. So uh, each of you has, has now given some inspiration to budding entrepreneurs on directions for um, future entrepreneurial efforts. Uh, with that in mind, um, uh, and Oliver, with you especially as a venture investor, what's the one piece of advice you would give to a healthcare startup before they march into their first investor meeting? What's the one thing you would tell them? Yeah. Be sure you get this right. So I get asked this a lot. There's the usual stuff, right? You need to shine as a team. You need to have a great idea, show it's a great market size and you're differentiated. There's all that. But I think you know, where I see often the story that's, that's less well told is who is your customer and what's going to incentivize them to adopt and to utilize this product? What is the value proposition? Very crisp and clear articulation of how you are going to uh, unlock, enable, power some type of outcome and tying that in healthcare to economics. The, the, the sad truth is, you know, to really scale companies in, in healthcare, it's, it's going to unlock revenue for someone or it's going to drive down cost. And, and uh, you know, it's also going to, you know, one would, would hope and trust, you know, transform an outcome. But, but you know, my, my, my advice to startups is come in clear and crisp with, with what that value proposition is, what that ROI is, because that will go a long way for an early startup company. Great. Daniel, same question to you. I'm sure much of your advice would be similar to what Oliver just said, but if there's something that would complement what, what Oliver said, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to a healthcare startup who's walking into their first investor meeting? Yeah, you're right, Johnny. Um, so there is one thing that I particularly like uh, when, when I see companies and uh, is when the value proposition and the, and the reading of the market um, basically have a win scenario no matter what happens. And let me give you an example. I had a, a friend in, in Europe who, who had you know, a trading company, mobile trading company for stocks. They would, he would just make fees on trading. And I remember when he was telling me, you know, if the market goes up, I make money because people trade. If the market goes down, I make money because people trade. And these are the kind of things that, you know, if you understand where the market is going, what is your value proposition that will, you know, allow you to win in most of the scenarios? So it's like the telemedicine company that I was mentioning. Like, do you want to be another one telemedicine? Okay, maybe, and maybe you can make a big company. But what if you have something that they all need to use no matter who wins or who loses? And this kind of combos is, is something that I like to hear and maybe if, 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 if their idea has this, this, this aspect, it becomes, in my opinion, interesting, in addition to everything that Oliver mentioned, because these are the fundamentals, right? Super. Wise advice there, too. Thomas, what's the, uh, you know, the one salient piece of information and advice you would give to uh, 
the startup before they go seek that first round as well, they walk into that meeting. Well, at this point, I'm, I'm really more of a getting advice and giving advice stage about this. I'm, I'm very much appreciate <clears throat> what Oliver and Daniel had to say. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I, I do think, um, well, I should say I, I'm sort of, I'm a late career first time uh, founder. So I, I, I sort of see things from a very different perspective than, than both Oliver and, and, and Daniel do. I, I, to, to me, I, what I think I should show is how committed I am to doing uh, the project that I'm proposing. Um, most of us don't go into these things um, and to do easy things. We go into them to do difficult things and, um, I, and, and to sort of achieve some success, both at uh, whatever level. To, to me, you have to be able to, to be committed to what you're doing and, and show that commitment very, uh, very, very aggressively, uh, very assertively. Um, and that would be the, my no, novice advice toward anybody doing the same thing that I'm attempting to do. Okay. Great. I'd just jump in and say, Thomas, could, yeah. couldn't agree more. And well, well, point well made. You know, that passion, that energy, that enthusiasm, it's, it's the first thing you see and it's the last thing you remember. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. That's good to hear from your perspective as well, Oliver. Yeah, uh, great points all. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes left, and I want to leave some time here for Iqlaq to do his, his wrap-up. And we had also gotten some questions that came in by email prior to the, this uh, webinar beginning, and I don't know that we'll get to all of them, but uh, let me start with what, what I think is one of the salient ones here, which is um, uh, healthcare costs in the U.S. are increasing uh, about 5% Per year, and this is actually a strategic uh, issue for American businesses. So um, the question is, what are the opportunities and recent innovations in digital healthcare that seem promising in crushing this cost curve? What are some things that each of you sees which seem promising in helping really flatten out this this rising cost curve in U.S. healthcare? Well, I, I, I'm willing to, to take a crack at this first. Um, and, and, and I will say that I, I, I haven't really studied healthcare economics as much as I would like to, but I, 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 I do think I have a bit of an understanding of it. W one thing that, that concerns me is, is the rate of increase, not only the rate of increase in the GDP that healthcare costs have accrued and, and steadily are accruing, uh, but, but also that the, the rate of increase of, say, healthcare administrators is outstripping the rate of increase of healthcare providers. Um, what, one approach to uh, that, that we're, we're very interested, and many others are as well, are, are using blockchain or other distributed ledger, ledger technologies to basically disintermediate a lot of the administrative processes that are required um, um, for uh, cost cost reimbursement and 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 and, and expense payment. Th this to me seems like a very rich area for cost containment, and and those costs, of course, can be rolled into higher quality healthcare and more, uh, healthcare access to more and more people. Uh, Daniel, have you seen any recent innovations in digital health which uh, seem promising and helping to crush this increase in the cost curve? To decrease the cost curve. Yeah, you know, the, the, the way I see it is, you know, there, there are many ways to decrease the cost of healthcare. Um, but, you know, digital, digital, digital technologies could help in the, in the general process. And what I mean by that is, if you can get the doctor to get much better and much more information about the patient, so the assessment is better. If you can give the doctor enough information to prescribe the right treatment to the right patient. And if you can, support the patient to adhere to the treatment that will save a lot of money. So, you know, in, in the first part, you have, you know, information coming to the doctor before the patient shows to the consultation, virtual follow-up, so you don't see the doctor once a year, but, you know, the doctor has your information once every week in a dashboard, so he has some, or she has a much more comprehensive view. Then precision medicine, something that links the data of the patient with the data of the potential treatments, and then digital solutions for adherence. I think uh, digital technologies could help optimize that process significantly and therefore drive costs down. Great, and Oliver, to, to cap this off and give the final comments here today. Uh, yeah, any... I think, oh. yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I think digital is gonna provide the, the transparency 
um, it, you know, that, that we need to really determine what is high value and, and, and what's not, right? You know, we, some of these tools, they're engaging patients across the continuum of care, um, everything from patient engagement focused tools to those that are helping extend patient monitoring and, uh, you know, out to the community following with, with that longitudinal timeline and arc and, and, and data to show how that uh, intervention at any point has improved care. You know, that that's going to be the, the, the future um, landscape that any new intervention is going to have to play in to prove its value to the healthcare system. So, you know, I think the digital is really the building blocks here and the, the, the macro shift towards value is, is happening um, because, as, as you said, healthcare spending isn't, isn't, isn't sustainable. So, you know, I'm excited that, that digital can be that uh, ledger, uh, that kind of source of truth on, on where, where improvement and value really resides. Um, it'll raise the bar for everyone. Thank you. Reinforcing all my biases on the primacy of data. Thank you. So um, <laughs> Thomas and Oliver and Daniel, uh, great comments from, from all three of you here during today's discussion. We've got about five minutes left. and I know Iklak wanted to ask some wrap-up questions here. So uh, let me hand it over to him so that we stay right on schedule. You're on mute. You're muted. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, all right, so first of all, great um, discussion. Let me tell you the some of the kind of like highlight points that I kind of picked out of, of it. Um, one is I like the point that you're making about adoption is actually faster these days. Uh, and I think you made the point that uh, in some ways you think that faster rate of adoption is actually gonna continue. I think we're seeing that in other industries too that um, things that were going to happen um, on, in the digital world are happening faster because we don't have really other alternatives. Um, you made a point on being more predictive. I, you didn't get very far into personalized medicine, particularly into um, the COVID treatment, but it just seems like uh, almost an ideal, um, uh, uh, it, actually, it's hard to use the word ideal and COVID in the same sentence, but it's, um, it's a match for, um, or at least it's a potential match. Uh, if you have all of this data and different people are being treated in different ways and you know their genetics, um, it just seems that this could be a test case which um, would actually accelerate personalized medicine. I'm, I don't know that you fully made that point. You started to make that point and then maybe you know, backed off from it. Uh, would be interested to know if, um, if you all agree with that. Um, another point that you made is basically there's a lot going on with data, AI, healthcare, but then you're bringing it back to um, all the basics to still apply, you know, in terms of being, as you say, clear, crisp, um, who are the customers, what's going to trigger adoption, uh, you know, don't get lost in the, um, you know, like data and AI can do so many things. I mean, like kind of basic you know, basic business sense uh, is meaningful. And then that last part of the conversation, of course, on um, the financial aspects, flattening the cost curve and things like this. Um, I think, okay, so if that's kind of like highlights of what we talked about, um, I think my kind of final like hope here in, in terms of uh, perspective from the group is how do, you know, how do we as a center or how do we as Berkeley best engage with these changes going on. Um, for example, uh, do you think that what we're doing with our data X and AI projects sh um, would be a fit with new ventures or um, with other companies? Do you think that we should be having a completely different healthcare lab, um, you know, like an X lab? Uh, is that um, is there too much already going on in the world there? Should we be offering a different type of course? Is there a skill gap that is um, not being addressed in the world? Uh, if you can help it, bring it back to the things where we have control, uh, that is levers, uh, which, which we can take actions on. Uh, that would be um, uh, like, it, it, it's hard question, but if you have suggestions, it would be really helpful. Oliver, Daniel. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to happy to make a, a quick quick comment. You know, it, it, like, I think clearly you're in a, an incredible position. You know, sitting within an academic institution, but having the entrepreneurial uh, kind of philosophy and and the stakeholders around you to really think about that translation. 
if there are opportunities to centralize unique data assets that Berkeley and your lab can get access to, you know, as an academic to become a sandpit for some of these uh, innovations we've said, you know, the, the, what we're seeing with genomic clinical video data from procedures, you know, there, there's probably unique and ripe opportunities for you to tackle some of these big problems. Um, so I, I'm really excited that you're engaging in this space. Um, you know, healthcare is its own, its own um, unique setting, so it, it needs that focus. Fantastic. Thank you for that input. Yeah, so um, just, just a little bit talking about healthcare specifically. One thing that is critical for innovators or startups to, to, to progress or you know, be able to grow is outcomes. They have to show that their solution works. And not all of them have the capability to show that. And not all of them have the infrastructure to do that. So maybe being in, in Berkeley, you can't, you know, include in your courses or your trainings, you know, this capability of, you know, we help you generate data for your own solution, even in, in, in real life, right? You have to be able to document the outcomes of your product, even when patients are out there and not in a, in a clinical trial facility. And then maybe partner with someone who has access to patients so they can have this shortcut to, 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 grow, to, to grow and, and, and expand because if they don't have the outcomes, they cannot sell. Uh, so, I mean, are you talking about, like, would personalized medicine be, like, the example there, uh, being able to collect data on outcomes and what kind of treatments were used, or is it that type of thing, or, or do you have something else in your mind? Yeah, I mean, that, that could be, you basically need, a, you know, a fast, low-cost, and data-driven way to capture outcomes in a robust way so you can sell to the stakeholders in the healthcare system. So it has to be a robust you know, analysis. And it could work for personalized, uh, personalized medicine in one way, but maybe for stress could work in a, in a different way. So it's, it's more the capability, right? It's how do, do I- Do the drug, that? do pharmaceuticals and, and others not already have this data? Are, are, they, are they not in a, like a better position, especially since there's so many privacy issues involved with all of this data? So if you are talking about pharmaceutical products, you know, for pharmaceutical products, you need the data, you do the clinical trials, right? Because otherwise you don't get the authorization and you cannot sell and you cannot promote, right? If you want to become more sophisticated, like in personalized medicine, not everybody has all the data. But I'm also talking about all those data-driven models, right? The startups, the, you know, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, you know, outside the, the corporations, they need to go and convince their potential customers with data and sometimes they don't have it. Many, many times they don't have it and this is a big struggle. And this is where I think we can help a lot. If I could be allowed to sort of add a bit onto the genomics and personalized medicine side, yeah. <clears throat> there are a number of things and this is really one of the core components we want to integrate into our uh, healthcare um, ecosystem, information ecosystem. Um, a few things now is there, there's really only a small percentage, even in a country like the U.S., of people who have had their genome sequenced, okay? Most of these are like not full genome sequence, whole genome sequencing, but just sequencing of certain parts of the genome. <clears throat> the other thing to say is um, in the U.S., probably unlike a, few, unlike a few isolated countries like Iceland, which has a very high percentage of people who have had their genome sequenced, the U.S. actually probably even though it's at the high end still, the percentage coverage is very low. And the other thing to say is the percentage coverage is not really distributed well across different social, economic, uh, racial groups uh, in a way that would allow <clears throat> very useful information to be interrogated from that. One thing to make personalized medicine and genomics more, more of a tool for prediction is there needs to be broader and more representative genome sequencing done. And, and a lot of these things really are tied in, once again, is how do you maintain and preserve privacy of this individual's information? Because we all know a lot, of it, there's a potential of this information to be misused. And we wanna make sure that it's, main, it's very secure and privately maintained. And, and this is where approaches like blockchain may, may be uh, a key. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and thanks. I was gonna go to you anyway, I mean like to, <laughs> get the full circle. Um, uh, I, I'm gonna take that as a, com I got all of that by the way, um, the um, complete data rep repository showing solutions, 
whether an XLAB could be centered around the data repository itself, um, the fact that people haven't had their full genome sequenced, uh, the racial disparity aspects and the privacy aspects. That, like, I, like I, I, I understand the, the input that you're, you're providing here. Uh, I want to say um, also thank you for um, taking the time to be on the panel, bringing your like different but deep expertise to like have a conversation that uh, you know no like one individual person can have with us. And thanks also Shomit for pulling all of this together. Uh, really appreciate it. Great, thank you everyone for, for attending. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.